Thank you very much, Ron, for that introduction, and uh, welcome, everybody, on what is actually a bit of a cold afternoon, but I gather at least you're all wearing pants today. This had been last Sunday, I learned this would have been something where there's a, on the subways or whatever. So at the end of the day, um, what I'm hoping uh, that I'll be able to do is spend a bit of time walking through um, what are our, our understanding is currently of Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS, as it's more formally known, and, and take you through a little bit of RNA biology. Now, I, I recognize that uh, this is an area of considerable complexity, and in my own personal philosophy is, is I show data, uh, and I show our analysis. But what I want to do is spend a bit of time in explaining to you how do we get there. Um, so I don't expect everybody to come away fully understanding every aspect of what we're looking at in terms of the cell biology, but I do hope towards the end you'll be feeling fairly comfortable that you have an understanding as to why do we think that this disorder may have a basis in alterations of RNA metabolism. And that's, that's really the basis of today's talk. In North America, we call this Lou Gehrig's disease, but if you were in Europe, it would be called motor neuron disease or Charcot's disease. Uh, and really, this disorder has been known since around 1860, a little bit earlier than that, depending on how deep you go into the literature. But Charcot is really recognized as being the father of understanding this disorder. And what he did was describe the clinical and neuropathological entity that we now know as being Lou Gehrig's disease. So really, by the time we get to 1874, you know, he is really the one who has established this disorder in which there is a progressive loss of muscle, so muscle atrophies, uh, the nerve fibers that are responsible for causing muscles to work, which arise on the surface of the brain and some deeper structures and then run all the way through the spinal cord and then meet up with a second set of cells which then go out and send messages to muscle fibers. That whole system degenerates, right? And it was he who recognized that and said, this is a single disorder. Now we know many, many years later, it's more than one disorder. It's, a, it's, it's what we call a syndrome of multiple disorders under one roof, all leading to the same effect. The cellular biology, though, has taken a while to catch up to that clinical understanding. And even on the clinical side, there's still many things that we need to understand more about this disorder. So here we look at a picture of Lou Gehrig's, Lou Gehrig himself, so in North America, right? And I would argue that Lou Gehrig is the single worst example of Lou Gehrig's disease that there could possibly be. Okay? <laughs> And here's the reason for it. If we look at survivorship, right? So we teach that Lou Gehrig's is a progressive, untreatable disease, right? That most people will live between three and five years from their first symptom onset from that. Well, that's not true. The majority will, but there are a population of individuals who have a very long-term survivorship. So here, if I look at the average survivorship, and this is just simply looking at cases from southwestern Ontario, we did this a few years ago, but this data exists whether you're at the Mayo Clinic or whether you're in Europe or somewhere else, right? So yes, most people, this is in months, you know, half of people will have died within 60 months. Look at this, what about this group? Here's a whole group of people who are out at 400 months from the time of onset and still alive, not on ventilators or otherwise for it. And these people tend to be young men less than the age of 45, whose first findings or symptoms are in their hand. Young man, less than the age of 45. First features, if you look, you can actually see a little bit of intrinsic atrophy going on here in his hands. Lou Gehrig should not have died within two to two and a half years of symptom onset. By all statisticals, he should have lived 20 to 30 years uh, with the disease, right? So this disease, we've got a lot to learn about. Just learning from the, the epidemiology of it, this immediately tells me this disease here can't be the same as somebody who's on this curve. Something else is going on. Gets into the concept that this is a syndrome, so there must be more than one thing happening there. Now part of the thing that's happening is we certainly know about aging, right? And so when we talk about the aging disorders, we talk about Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and we talk about Lou Gehrig's disease. Right? And if we look at, at, at Lou Gehrig's, you have this sort of distribution curve, which is called a histogram of age of onset. So here we are, sixth decade of life, most likely to get the disease. Right? We certainly see it in younger age. I see teenagers referred from across the country uh, to look at. So it happens. And I certainly see, and increasingly we're seeing more in the healthy aged population. But by and large, this is the peak. Now, what we've got over here are health can stats, right? So the aging of our population. So if we look here at 2001, the white histogram, right? And here we are, fifth, sixth, seventh decades of life. And this is what it looked like 10, 15 years ago. 
2026, though, what is it going to look like? How many of you are baby boomers? Yeah. So that's you, right? I would love to say this is me. Not true. I'm here too. Okay. So what's going to happen? This. Right? So a disorder in which the peak age of onset is here in the fifth and sixth decade of life is now going to be still peak age of onset, fifth and sixth decade of life. But the baby boomers will have moved forward and they will be at that peak. So we expect and are already seeing significant increases in the number of individuals who are affected with Lou Gehrig's, Parkinson's, and, and Alzheimer's, right? as part of the natural aging process that sits there with that. So the difficulty is, is how do we actually understand these disorders? Right? And, and for those of you who know of individuals who have been afflicted with ALS, I do not have a drug that will stop it in its process. Right? Don't have one. So why is that? Right? A lot of work going on worldwide. Lots of great work happening in Canada. ALS Society of Canada is doing immense amount of work. Right? The bucket challenge. Right? That's been translated into a lot of active. So why don't we have the answer? So the answer to that answer is that we have a lot going on simultaneously. Right? And I liken this to coming across a train wreck. I, I can only arrive at the end of the train wreck. I only get a chance to look, right? But I don't know how many trains were involved until I sorted out. I don't know whether it was a passenger train until I have a good look. I don't know how many people were injured in it. I don't know whether there was a vehicle crossing or whether it had just gone off the tracks. All I know is I've got a train wreck and I've got to figure it out. And that's what's happening in ALS. I have a train wreck where those cells are dying. And we know that there's all sorts of abnormalities happening simultaneously which are leading to the death of that cell. So who's first? What happens? And in, and in my labs, what we've been focusing on are really two of them, trying to link together the derangements in the cytoskeleton of the cell, and I'll show you that in a moment, to how are those cytoskeletal elements formed, which is really getting us to the RNA metabolism, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So the big change that has occurred in the course of the last decade, really decade and a half, in, in our thinking about Lou Gehrig's, is we have moved from a concept of traditional pathology. So although Charcot, when he looked down the microscope, would not have seen these because the tools didn't live at that time, certainly 30 years ago, 25 years ago, when I started my training, this is what we knew, right? That when we looked at motor neurons, and so these are cells in the spinal cord from an individual who has died from Lou Gehrig's and whom we did an autopsy on. And then we're able to look under the microscope at the affected cells. So these are human motor neurons, very large cells. They're the biggest cells in the body, right? They're upwards of 75 microns, which to us is big. And they have these massive processes, right, which then run out to this. Right? So if I was a motor neuron, and this room was a motor neuron, and this was a cell body, the business end, the end of the neurite, the process that's going out, would be in Boston. Okay? That's how big these are. That's the amount of energy that's required right, to make it work. Right? So big cells, but you can see, and I'm just going to kill the lights here for just a second. How's that working? How are you on back there? Can I leave it like this? Great, everybody's good. All right, except for the video guy, but oh well. Anyways, you can see within these cells, these little kind of squirrely-like things, right? Little, little waves. I'm going to show you those in a little bit more detail. They shouldn't be there. These big rocks should not be there, right? Those are intermediate filaments. This happens to be neurofilament, and I'll, I'll show you what that is in just a moment. And here's another type of it, and same thing in here. And if they're going to be destroyed, they have this unusual pattern about them that we can mark with something called ubiquitin. tells me it's going to be degraded. So this is classic. This is what we thought haven't changed our mind, but this is one key piece of it. So what changed? Well, over the last decade, we've come to realize there's a second family of aggregates within these cells. Not the intermediate filaments, but these things, what we call RNA binding proteins. And when we look, we see them forming rocks, or these dot-like structures, or these skein-like structures. Right? All of these sitting within, and they should not be there. They should not be in that format. So the question is, where do they come from and how do they form? How do we get these kinds of structures forming within the cells and how do they change the way the cell actually metabolizes? So we're going to answer that question and I'm going to 
turn that down again in a minute, but I have three volunteers from St. Mike's, right? Yeah. Great. These are all young guys who have no future. No, you've got a great future, okay? <laughs> and they're going to help us out today in building these molecules, right? And then they're going to help us prove or disprove. So come on up on the stage, guys. I'm going to give you each your marching orders. And they get, to, they get to have some fun during the course of this and get to play a little bit. So they're going to get a bunch of pipe cleaners. Now, each, each group of pipe cleaners has a long one, right? And a shorter one. And their job is to build an RNA binding protein, which is actually quite easy because we've got the business end of it. And then we have something that I'll tell you about later, which is called the intrinsically disordered piece. Be important. And all they have to do for the next little while is sit there knitting while I'm talking and produce a whole lot of these. Okay? Got an intrinsically disordered piece and they got the business end. Okay, the RNA binding protein. And we're going to prove or disprove where these things come from later on. Now, I didn't make it that easy. First off, they're all color-coded, which is really important, right? And they're not all the same size. But they all contain that little business piece. So I'm going to to my erstwhile colleagues here. Each one gets a package. And off you go. Thanks, guys. They'll be back later, okay? <laughs> and they're going to help test a hypothesis, which we can then prove or disprove using microscopy, okay? So where do these things come from and why are they so important, right? That's the question. So let's start with a little bit of a discussion about relationships. And if you were okay with this and everybody's all right, then we'll, we'll stay with this because a lot of the slides I'm gonna show you are from, a, from either electron microscopy or what we call confocal and I'll show you that in a minute. But these intermediate filaments, so if you were going to build a highway from here to Boston, we talked about that in our right, you'd want bridges, you'd want structure, you'd want to have some way of ensuring traffic is going in the right direction, right? You don't want everybody going on the same strip of road in two different directions, not a great idea, right? So you want to build that highway and you want to maintain its structure and that's what intermediate filaments do, right? So these filaments, which are called neurofilaments, come together and they must first have the smallest one, which we call NFL, light, okay? And then we have a little bit larger one called NFM, middle molecular weight, and then NFH, high molecular weight. We're not the most creative in science sometimes, right? It's just descriptive, and that's their size. I need two of these to come together first. So they must form a polymer that come together as one structure. And then these two layer onto it. And when they do, they have these large, large side arms. And those side arms are negatively charged. So imagine if I was a neurofilament standing here, right? And I've had my core polymer made. And now I've got these two carboxy terminuses. So they're phosphorylated ends, right? And they're negatively charged, right? Now we know from elegant work that was done in France that those arms are out at the side, right? And they have a negative charge to them. So how many of you remember playing with magnets as a child? Everybody, right? What happens when you put two negative charges together? They push apart, right? So that's what happens. You change the structure based on the negative charge and those arms, but you need to have them form first, and it's really dependent on this. And depending on the charge, we have different spatial arrays. And you can see the little arms here. Just in case you thought I was yanking your chain. They really exist. And so we think about the structures of these neurons, right, as being held together by this really important array, right? It creates the highway and maintains that dynamic. Now, there's lots of other pieces in it, but this is a core component. And in ALS, we have a train wreck. Remember that beautiful array that I was showing you earlier where you could see side arms and everything else? That doesn't exist here. This is one of these rocks at an electron microscopy level. So I'm looking with magnifications of thousands. I'm looking at the individual structures in here. So can you imagine if this was the 401 and this was Oshawa and this rock was sitting on the 401 on Labor Day weekend, on Friday afternoon at about 4.30. And you're at the 427 thinking you're heading to Kingston. Where are you going? Nowhere, right? These mitochondrial structures, these RNA structures are going nowhere. 
they're stuck within that aggregate. So you get these aggregates forming and you really disrupt the way the cell works, right? You can't go anywhere with that. Is that just a theory? No. Beautiful work over the last decade and a half by a number of labs in actually genetically modifying how those proteins come together, changing in any way the ratio of that small, so the low, medium, or high. You change any one of those from the way they're supposed to be made and in the right ratio, and you get motor neurons that die, and you create a motor neuron disorder. So our evidence experimentally that this is really important. And then in work that we did about a decade and a half ago, really following on beautiful work by Kathy Bergeron here at U of T in the early 1990s, we asked the question, well, if this is in fact a train wreck due to a change in the ratio and the synthesis of these proteins, could we track it back to the RNA level? And so this is what's called in situ hybridization. Now, nowadays we do this with colorimetric ways, but in my time, this is all done with radioisotopes. And every dot that you see here, every dot, is an RNA complex. And you'll come back in a moment, you'll understand what that means. And we go and we count by hand at that time every single dot. Now, I didn't do it. Nelson Wong did, graduate student, darn near killed him, right? Two and a half years of work, counting these one by one and comparing them. And what we found was that when we looked at the amount of RNA that was available to make these proteins, it was perfectly fine for the big two. It was missing for the littlest one compared to control. So we weren't making enough of it. Something was wrong. And remember, the little guy has to come together first in at least two before anything else happens. So if it's missing, we're in trouble. So why was it missing? And this is an experiment that we, we in science, or at least in my world, talk about the, the rocking chair experiment. This is the experiment at the end of the day when I'm retired, sitting in a rocking chair at the end of a dock with a small scotch in my hand, thinking back, what went really well? And what was easy? This was that. This is a simple experiment. And all we've done is said, well, if in fact it's related to the RNA and there's not enough of it, what's happening to the RNA? So can we actually destroy the RNA simply by exposing it to the spinal cord tissues of somebody who had ALS compared to control. So imagine, if you will, I can grow a RNA, I can make this, I can put it into a test tube, and then from individuals who have passed away, I can take samples of the spinal cord and do nothing to it other than add it to the tube where the RNA is, and then ask, 10 minutes later, is it still there? 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and I can measure that, and it will degrade over time. And sure enough, there's a difference between whether you have ALS or not. So if I'm looking at my cases, and this is the stability, right? So here is my control cases. I've mixed that with spinal cord material, and it degrades. It disappears at a specific rate. Here's my ALS one, and this is what science is all about. It's the exact opposite to what I thought I would see. It's actually more stable. And if I take the tissue and all I do is take my test tube and I just mix the difference between somebody who's got ALS and who does not and change that, I can change the stability back and forth. And then I can boil it or I can degrade a protein and get rid of that effect. So there's something that sits within that tissue which is clearly regulating the stability. Now I've got to figure out how does that relate in fact to the RNA itself. Well, to leap forward from that experiment to about a decade later, we now know that there's a whole series of proteins which are expressed which do that, which cause that regulation. So let's spend a moment and just talk a little bit about how RNA is made, okay? Because RNA right, is the middleman. Everybody knows about DNA, right? Anybody here not know about DNA? Great, okay? So there's the phone book, right? Your genes. And each section of that is one copy. But you need hundreds of thousands of proteins right, just to make a hair follicle. Right? So really inefficient to take that one copy and just keep making one protein and then the next and then the next. You want to amplify it. So what happens is we take that, the DNA code, we read that and we create thousands of RNAs off of it. And those thousands of RNAs are sent out into the cell. And each one of those RNAs makes thousands of proteins. So it's a signal amplification pathway, right, to get you to the point where you have these proteins being made. OK? 
Okay? So how does that look? Okay, so here in the nucleus we have our DNA. We actually transcribe it and we create these little fragments which have a binding protein and they are shipped out into the cell itself. In the cell body it is then modified. In this case it's going to be targeted to be transported and we're going to put a motor on it to make it work. Okay? And then we're going to load that onto that highway. We're going to ship it out all the way to where it needs to be, at the, in this case, at the presynaptic terminus, so at the end of where that neuron is. So this has gone to Boston now. We are then going to take it apart and rebuild it. Don't ask why, we just do that. Okay? And then from that, we're actually going to make the protein that we want. Okay, that's called translation. Okay? Now we're going to take a little piece of that and we're going to send it back, back down the highway, to say, don't make any more, I got lots. Okay? Sounds really simple, doesn't it? When I was taught as a medical student and when I started my training, and actually in the early 1990s, we thought that every single time a protein was made, it was made at the cell nucleus or the cell body and shipped to where it needed to be. We now know that it's actually moved out. The RNA complex goes, right? Anybody know what country first made that discovery? Canada, okay? First discovered by work done by Jack Diamond really hypothesized at McMaster, right? So, now, it's not that simple, right? However, the concept is the same. We know about the RNA, right, being made off the DNA. You want to regulate it. You don't want to just keep making and making and making it, right? So you have to have some controls in place. And then you also have some controls that say that, you know what, I've got enough of it out here. I don't need it anymore. Let's get rid of it. Let's degrade it, right? and use it over again. So those are actually what we call processing bodies. So we can flip it out into here. We know that if I injure a neuron, it will first respond and say, I know you've injured me. I'm not sure what I need exactly, but let's make a lot of it. And let's just hang out for a while. That's a stress granule. So a little bundle of RNA, all ready to go, right, waiting to be turned on. And then we've got a whole bunch of it that's being moved out to where we actually need it to be. So these are really complex processes that need to be regulated. Otherwise, we just have proteins being made all over the place, right? So we regulate that. It gives a whole host of ways now where things can just simply go wrong, right? Imagine every step that's required there. And imagine that if every one of those steps went wrong, you'd end up with a disaster with regards to proteins. You'd have too much, you'd have too little. You'd have the wrong ratio. Right? You'd end up with the aggregates that we're talking about. So we can do a lot of things even after it's been made, and that's where we've been focusing our work. So today, I'm not going to take you through all of that. I'm going to focus on just one piece. Right? And this one piece is, is really what has changed the way that we think about all of this. And that is it, that we're just going to say that we have normal proteins that regulate these RNA species. It's normal. They're supposed to be there. That's their job. Right? What happens when normal becomes abnormal? Right? Bruce Coburn song, the problem with normal, it always gets worse. Good, excellent. All righty, a little more Canadiana history for you there. Okay, how complex are these things? Right? I love putting this slide up for my students, you know, when we're thinking about this, right? Because it's easy to get used to the idea that we're doing everything that's important in the world, right? We must be, right? We get funded, we work in the lab, we come up with an answer. Right? We've got to be right. So here's NFL, the RNA for that smallest one. Right? Remember the one that has to come together first, made into a polymer, and then everything else? So this is, this is its RNA species. Half of it, half, is the business end. Right? So this is what makes the, uh, the protein itself. Half of it in green is actually the regulatory element. So half of that RNA is responsible for controlling the other half of it. So this isn't a minor function. Now that's not surprising to my lab, where I, I surprise particularly my new grad students to say, okay, so we've really been known for regulating and understanding how this regulation is done. Do you know where my lab works? Right here. See that little red? That's my life. Okay. Sad, I know, right? But at the end of the day, you have to always remember, right? It's like looking up in the star, star, stars and saying, I know one constellation, therefore I know them all. I don't, 
right? We have a really good idea what's happening here. We're working on figuring out all the rest of it. So there's a lot of work to be done here yet. But even with that, we already know what's going on, or at least we think we do. So these RNA binding proteins, right? These, remember I showed you on that second slide and I said the contemporary pathology? Well, here's one of them, TDP43, right? One of the kids on the block that was discovered in the late 1990s, right? Beautiful work. But here it is, this is an ALS motor neuron, right? And now this is, I'm gonna introduce you to the concept of confocal microscopy at the same time, because we're gonna use that a lot as our tool here. So what I'm doing is, and uh, believe it or not, this, I actually took this, so I do work occasionally in the lab, right? This is a motor neuron, right? So there's a nucleus up here which you don't see. Here's that cell body. And I managed to actually see most of its process, the highway, at its origin. That's really rare. This was after about 10 hours of working at the microscope and we saw this, right? So this is a single cell. This is 75 microns, right? So this is the room and this gets us maybe, maybe to the Gardner, okay? And what I've done is I've used an antibody, which is just a way of creating something that will recognize an individual protein, so it's relatively specific, and I've put a fluorescent marker on it. And I've shone a laser on that. And the laser excites that marker and gives me green. Or if I change the marker, it gives me red. And if the two are related to each other, right, what happens when you take a red and a green and you overlap them? You get orange or yellow, right? Depending on the light. So you can start to see whether they occur together. So the important thing here is that here's this RNA binding protein, and you see all these little worm-like structures in here? Those are called schemes. That's pathology. They shouldn't look at that. And one of the things that we can do with confocal is we can actually look through the plane. So here we are looking down, and you can see they come, and then there's other ones, and then there's a new one, right? and they continue to form, right? So you get skeins up here, you get another one here, those two aren't related to each other. There's another one in here, right? So all through the length of the cell, these things are forming and they should not be there. They shouldn't be interrelating to each other. So if I asked my three colleagues who are helping in the lab right now, right, and say, well, though each one of those is an individual protein, right? And if we took one of those and we put them together, and you'd see just one protein, just like that. And this has created the concept for us that ALS is a disorder of RNA binding proteins, but we identify it as single proteins. So we would say that this is a TDP43 opathy. Okay. So we think of ALS must be a TDP43, that's the RNA binding protein, opathy. One protein, one disease. Okay? Everybody remember that. That's the dogma. Guys? We're gonna prove in a moment whether that's right or wrong, right? Perfect. Okay, there's the hypothesis. The dogma is correct. We'll see. So what is this protein, right? And so this is a very common features that we're gonna be looking at here, right? So it is an RNA binding protein. It has a domain, and we know that there are several different forms that are expressed in the cell, but it has a business component to it, right? So these two areas are required for binding to the RNA, and then they regulate it. And then there's this whole piece off here, right, uh, which is actually the rest of the protein. And that actually, as I'll show you shortly, is what we call intrinsically disordered. It binds other proteins. It brings people to the party to help control things. Right? We know that it's abnormal in ALS because we can see those aggregates for sure, right? But we also know that if we look, right, we find all sorts of mutations in there. And mutations are what are inherited in familial forms of the disease. And we know that between 5 and 10% of ALS individuals will carry a genetic variant. And this is one of the genes. Here's a second one, FUS, also an RNA binding protein, closely related to TDP43 in many ways. Also, lots of genetic mutations sitting within it. So as a cellular biologist, we look at this and go, great, I got two pieces of evidence that suggest that this is really important to ALS. It's mutated in the disease, and it forms these aggregates which shouldn't be there. It also turns out that it's a really important protein that binds to the neurofilament RNA and regulates it. We know that there's an interaction, and I won't go through all of this, but this basically proved it um, shortly after the protein was discovered. 
And we know that we require that whole TDP43 to stabilize the species. So remember, things are moving out, right? I don't want it to be destroyed, so let's keep the RNA as stable as we can for a bit. That's what this does. It's one of its functions. Where is it normally? Okay, so now, confocal again, right? Now I've got three things going on here. You can increase the complexity. The blue is actually the nucleus of the cell, right? The red is TDP43. These are motor neurons, right? Uh, and this green is an entirely different, right? This is looking at degradation going on. But we're gonna focus on this guy here. Now one of the nice things about confocal microscopy is you can do this. You can take it and you can rotate it around and you can flip it and you can ask, where is that TDP43 normally located? Normally, the majority of it sits within the nucleus. You don't see anything. The rest of the cell is all out here, right? This is just the nucleus. So that's what you expect to see, right? That's a healthy neuron. Here's a not so healthy neuron. This is Lou Gehrig's disease. So now the red is still the TDP43. These are all nuclei of other cells in here. And we've got that ubiquitin again in here. So this one, right? Now we've got this confocal micrograph and think of it as a loaf of bread, okay? And what you see is one slice of the bread. I'm gonna give you the rest of the loaf. And we're gonna look up and down and see what's happening in that cell, okay? And so what's happening in that cell as we go through slice after slice and reconstruct each one of these is, watch what you're seeing up here. Right? Do you see that skein-like structure? See it over here? Right? See it over here? Right? That's not normal. Now, maybe this increased expression could be just a responsive injury. That's fine, and we've proven that. But forming those string-like structures, those skeins, that's not normal. That's pathological, and it's occurring within these cells. So then when you look at the individual neuron itself, you start to see all of these structures, right? These filaments that should not be within that cell, right? And how are they forming? Well, how does that happen? And is that the only one that does that? Right? And the answer is, of course not. Wouldn't be here if that was the case. Okay? There's another kid on the block, and this is one that we discovered a few years ago. Right? Now, this is called RGNEF. It's got a long name for it, Roguani Nucleotide Exchange Factor. We'll just call it RGNF, so that's painful. Right? And it binds that RNA as well. Okay? So, it's also very unique. Right? It happens to have a really complex RNA binding domain. I won't go into all the other aspects of it, but it has a big area where it interacts with other proteins as well. It's a common feature to this. Binds RNA and it brings people to the party, right, for regulatory elements. Okay. Here's what it looks like in an experimental model where we actually just injure. We, we actually cut the axon. Uh, so basically do this in a, in a mouse model where we cut the nerves going down into the leg and go back later to look at what's happening in those motor neurons. And we see a massive increase in expression. This green is where we've marked it, right? So it does what it's supposed to do. It goes up in response to a neuronal injury. We know that it binds NFL, the low molecular weight RNA. That's what this series of experiments proved. So it's key to regulating that highway Right? Definitely something we wanted to see. We wanted to ask the question, is it truly functional? Right? Can it do that? So we do something called a, a firefly luciferase assay. Basically, genetically, all we do is take firefly luciferase. Everybody's seen fireflies, right? right? They fluoresce at night. Right? Kind of cool, catch one. Well, if you catch one, put it in a wearing blender along with a lot of its friends and purify its protein, guess what you get? You get its genes. And you can take its genes, and you can take that firefly piece, right? And you can take that gene, and then you can add whatever you want to the end of it of another gene. And so every time this gene is expressed, it makes a piece of firefly. And so you can just measure the fluorescence, right? And so you know whether something's working or not based on measuring what you and I play with at nighttime when we're camping, okay? So you can quantify that, and you can ask the question, can I change the stability of this? And great little assay. 
And so right away, you can start to test if you have the RNA, so we can take the human neurofilament, the smallest one, put it onto a bit of firefly fluorescence, right? And it's gonna fluoresce, it's gonna be expressed at a certain rate. And if I stabilize that, right, so it's not degrading, you're gonna get more fluorescence, right? So remember, I told you TDP43 is a stabilizer. It keeps things nice and stable as it's going out there. Sure enough, lots more firefly fluorescence going on, right? We'll ignore this for a moment, it's important to us, but not to the rest of the world. And this RGNEF, here's ours, and it destabilizes, right? It leads to a loss of the transcript. Right? Now we're starting to see what I wanted to see 10 years ago when we did that rocking chair experiment, remember? When I mixed things together, and I think there was a nod over here, got it right away, sort of said, that's not what you wanted to see. We wanted to see it destabilized, not stable. Here's the destabilizer. And wouldn't it be nice if it actually leads to reduced protein at the same time? And indeed, less protein. It almost, when we express it within cells, and that's what this experiment is showing, we can then put that gene into cells in culture, and those cells normally make this protein, and when we put the gene into it, it shuts off the protein. You don't have it anymore. But here's the million dollar experiment. When we look for it in human spinal cord, we certainly find it, right? But it only binds to the neurofilament RNA if you have ALS, okay? Really important. Doesn't matter whether you've got familial ALS here or you've got sporadic ALS. And these sets of experiments, and there's multiple more pieces to this, here we have something that we know is normally expressed we normally would regulate, it leads to a downregulation, and it only binds in ALS tissues. So that would have been a nice place to quit, right? No, let's make an antibody to it. Let's go and look for it, okay? So we did that, we created a way of actually seeing whether this was forming in cells. And here you see it, this is ALS cells. Massive upcrease, increase, or these snake-like structures, right? So it's forming pathology. And a work that we haven't published yet, so you get to see this because it'll be getting published shortly, right, is that we now have evidence that it's genetically modified in familial ALS, right? So it's one of the causes of the inherited forms as well. And what's really interesting is here's the whole protein. When we put a mutation in, that mutation gives rise to just a small little fraction of the protein, not the whole thing. And if we put that small little fraction of a protein into neuronal cells, Guess what? It forms aggregates. Exactly what we're looking for in the human tissue. More importantly, it also incorporates TDP43. It brings a second binding protein in, so it starts to sequester that. Now remember, I just told you that TDP43 is important for stabilizing. What if I pull it out of the equation? Now you've lost your stabilizer, and you've got the binding of this protein. So now you're getting a loss of it. So when we begin to look and go back to these RNA binding protein stories, is this true? And I'm gonna bring my three erstwhile colleagues up for this. Is it true then that we have individual fibrils like this? How is it that they're relating to each other? Well, it's called intrinsically disordered domains. So, an intrinsically disordered domain, here's fuss, Here's TDP43, and here's RGNEF, okay? The three that we've been talking about. This is the one we discovered, this is the one that was discovered in the late 1990s, and this one was shortly after, right? And every time you get a value greater than 0.5 here on this graph. So this is just the length of the protein, right? You can see it sort of demonstrated here. And every time you see it, and it goes up above that, that's what we call intrinsically disordered. Glue. An intrinsically disordered domain binds to itself, binds to others, okay? So, come on guys, let's do a little experiment here. If we were correct, okay, and we're gonna take one of each of these. So this guy, right, we got a nice long one here. So all I've done is created, you've created, right? Each of you just hold one up. You can see that you've got this longer domain, okay? So it's the region that's the business side, okay? And then here, 
we have something called the intrinsically disordered. It's just the second color, right? So everybody's got one. And notice that they are different lengths. Good job, intertwine them. Even longer, right? If we are thinking correctly, right, and this is a single protein disorder, how do you guys think that these things would interrelate? What would we see as a fibril? Where would they bind? Right? You'd put them together and they'd bind like this, right? Intrinsically disordered domain to intrinsically disordered domain, right? Could go like this too, right? And then the next one might go like this, right? And so eventually, right, what would it look like, guys? If you have all of yours and you're putting them together, you'd have one protein, right? One single color, all interrelated. Could look like that, could like a clump there or a clump there. So that's what we believe. Right now, when we talk about Lou Gehrig's disease, we say that we've got a disorder where you're the cause. Sorry about that. Right, you okay? I'm okay. Great, okay. You guys, sorry, you're the cause too. But you're different from him, right? So this, this is actually TDP43, right? So you are the cause of the majority of ALS because we call it a TDP43 apathy. Okay? But some families inherit you and the fibrils look like yours, right? That's all that they are. And you're fuss. Sorry about that. You're a fussopathy, okay? Now you work for me, right? You're in my lab. Nobody believes this. You guys do now, right? And actually everybody believes it now. So, but nobody calls it an RGNEF-opathy because it's hard to do, right? But you're the third kind of ALS. Right? So if we're correct, and you know, if I have a way of looking at our individual cells, and you're a fusopathy, you're a tdp 43 apathy, and you're an rgnf apathy, what should we see in the individual cells when I do the confocal microscopy? I should only see one of you, right? What if that's wrong? Right? What might it look like? What if you guys all work together? Right? You're the master deregulator. You're the one that actually causes me as neurofilament to be degraded. You're supposed to stabilize me and you've taken off because you're hanging out with him. Right? And you? <laughs> right? You're doing the same thing. You're supposed to stabilize me, but you're not. Right? So if you're all going wrong at the same time, and remember I said at the beginning, the cell really thinks about how do we get from here to Boston and make sure that everything is stabilized for that entire length. Right? And so maybe we make all of you at the same time, right? So I want you to go back to your seats, and I want you to work quietly together. And what would it look like if you were all doing it at the same time? You can't take apart what you've got because you've already made it. You are RNA binding proteins. But what would I expect to see if I look and all of you are there at the same time? What would this look like? And I want you to build me a nice long one, okay? Six feet long, okay? Because we're getting to Boston, okay? Great, guys, off you go. You got one more experiment. If you can't do it, it means I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. Where's your teacher? We're marking this baby, right? Yeah, okay. Everybody comfortable with that? So we've sent our little RNA binding proteins off. They're gonna build this for us, and they're gonna prove that theory right or wrong, right? Remember the hypothesis at the beginning was a single cell, single protein, single disease. Right? So we have a tdp 4 a we have a fusopathy, and we have, right? So each one is independent of each other. I will tell you right now, I don't believe that, I never believed that, and I still don't believe that. So why? How can I prove that? So we're going to return to the confocal, right? And you folks get a chance to tell me the answer to the experiment even before they give me the experiment. Okay? So here's the methodology. Here's what I'm going to show you. Okay, so this is a motor neuron in ALS. Now look at all the different colors in there, right? Remember I told you by confocal I could actually now use all sorts of different antibodies simultaneously. If I take a red and a green one and they are overlapping to each other, I get yellow, right? So here's one where I've looked at two different things. Now this is an easy one because this is our GNEF, so this is our new protein, it's green. So we can see the green here. I've used a marker for it being degraded in red, so we can see that in some of these fibrils. And where the two are together, it goes yellow. 
right? So it means that they're all twisting together. Everybody feel real comfortable with that? Because it's really important, because we're going to come back to it, right? And we're coming to the end of the talk, so hang with me, okay? And all I've done here is magnify it, and then magnify it even further. And look at this. I mean, for me, isn't this beautiful? It's gorgeous. I mean, look here. Just look at this one fibril we've caught on the side. I've got the green RGNEF, I've got my red ubiquitin, and they are two are working side by side. They are integrated into the same fibril. Right? How's it going, guys? Six feet yet? You're getting there. Keep working. Okay, so now let's do that. Here's a cell. This is a motor neuron. I've got RGNEF here. You can see the fibrils that are forming in it. I'm now going to use my second antibody, which is that ubiquitin. It's in red. Right? When the two are in the same spot, it should go what? Sort of yellow. Kind of hard to see. So why don't we get rid of everything except where the top 2% of co-localization is and make it white. Right? Now it's still hard. Let's get rid of all the background. Okay? And that's what you're left with. This is the skeleton sitting within that motor neuron. Right? Everywhere this is white means that those two proteins, the degradative protein, and the RGNF are absolutely one beside the other. It's the top 2% of it within the cell. And we have other ways of proving it to confirm that. But on this level for the confocal, right, this is what you're going to want to be looking for in the next few slides. Okay? Where is it white? It means that the two together. This was easy because this just tells me it's being degraded. Let's move on to RGNF and TDP43. Okay? So I've got two of my guys over there. You must be interrelating, because look at this. Here I've done TDP43 at the same time, in the same cell, asking the question, are they both there abnormally? And here we see these structures. This is a motor neuron. Right? And you can see green, again, is my, TDP, is my RGNF. The red is my TDP43. Right away, that's against dogma. Same cell, two different types of fibrils. Ooh. Okay, and now they're co-localizing, and here's the yellow. And I can bring them down and prove it otherwise. So what about that type of an image? So here it is within the cell. RGNEF, big rock, all of these aggregates sitting in here. Next will be the red, which is TDP43. You don't even need to co-localize them. Look at that. They're right on top of each other in the same structure. But let's do it anyways. They're yellow. Let's Top 2%, make it white, so that's going to come up next. And then let's get rid of all of the background and leave only that single cell, right, as one. And look at this. Within that spinal motor neuron, we have two RNA binding proteins, not one abnormal. Two. Okay? Nope. RGNF and FUS, the third one. Right? This is really beautiful to me. I don't know about you guys, but we love this. Okay? Here's a motor neuron. Here are the skeins sitting within the cell. Look at this. Right? RGNF is green again. And in that same fibril, same fibril, some of it is made up of fuss. Sometimes it overlaps. Right? And when we look within that cell, here's a different one, but same process. Right? My RGNF is green. So again, we're seeing all of these skeins and structures that aren't supposed to be there. And now I'm going to add in my fuss. Look at that. Even out into the highway, I'm seeing aggregates of fuss. Right? And when I look at that absolute co-localization, right, a huge chunk of it is both simultaneously. Right? And so now we get rid of everything, and we see the structure. And even as we follow out along the highway, we see regions where the two are together. Now we've got three. What do you think of our hypothesis, right? So, have a look at this. So guys, come on back up. Have you made this? <laughs> have you? Come on, show me how you've done it. What do you think we should see? What should they be bringing up? Yes, absolutely, right? If they've done this right, we should be seeing that they are all, sometimes they're skipped, sometimes they're overlapping to each other, right? And they should be one big linear array. So come on over to the middle. We're almost there. 
You're almost finished. Yeah, the cell's dead already, guys. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, this is what's happening, right? It's not one by itself. It's multiple simultaneously doing this, okay? Now, I've still got some areas where the RNA can interact, right? So, let me borrow this for a second. Okay, thanks. Sorry, guys. Look familiar? Okay. So, hypothesis, right or wrong? ALS is a disorder of a single RNA binding protein. Right or wrong? Right. No. Nope. Wrong. It's multiple binding proteins simultaneously. Right? And you just, guys just made it. You just made this. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. By the way, they passed. Okay. So, if we're right, we should be able to go into ALS tissues and ask the question, can I ever differentiate amongst a case that has a mutation in FUS, or a mutation in TDP43, or an RGNEF case, or any of the other ones that sit behind it? And send in another graduate student and say, here's all of our cases. I can't tell you and won't tell you which is which. Tell me if you can tell me. And the answer is, you cannot. So when you go back and you look at the cases, you actually can define them as being a disorder of RNA metabolism. And we've just taken one window to it. Right? But this is a fundamental shift in our concepts of ALS. And certainly a fundamental shift in our thinking of RNA biology in ALS. Because what we've done is we've said that every time we've stood up and said, this is an opathy of whatever RNA binding protein we think it is, we're wrong. Right? This is a disorder in which RNA metabolism en masse is disturbed. We think it's disturbed because one of the packages is off. And it's the package that is required to repair that neuron that's been injured. And the neurofilament is the common linker to that. And so these protein aggregates that we see are not what we call homopolymers, single proteins. They are what we call heteropolymers, multiple proteins simultaneously. And if I create a mess that looks like this, can you, in your wildest dreams, think how this would regulate RNA metabolism? No. Can't be done. Every site that you want to access is going to be buried within that. I had a bunch of styrofoam balls, and I was going to get them to try and put the balls inside. I thought, that's too much punishment. Okay? So, at the end of the day, is ALS a disorder of RNA metabolism? I think so. Does it have to be one kind? Remember, I only showed you one pathway. I showed you one out of the three, and I was only focusing on one end of the pathway. So you can get here by lots of different ways. I've just done it by showing you how you take the proteins, misfold them, but they're still normal, and they form these aggregates. So, do I do all of that? No. Right? My job is to actually feed them on a regular basis. Right? <laughs> these are, this is my lab. Right? This is my backyard or summer party. Right? But this takes a lot of work. Right? And it takes a lot of support. I really want to, the ALS Society of Canada has funded me since 1990 to do this work right, uh, for it. Uh, Canadians, right, Canadians are the single highest producers of new knowledge on the biology of ALS per capita. For the amount of money that goes forward, we've created more of this. This isn't just my work, this is a lot of others. And it's been the ALS Society of Canada which has been really important to this. So, end of the day, Hopefully I've convinced you of that. And the final question, anybody would know what this is? What would it be? It's the corn flower. Yeah, it's the national flower of the ALS Society. So, thank you very much for being attentive, a long talk, but hopefully I've convinced you ALS is a disorder of RNA metabolism. Thanks. Thank you.